today, a few new answers, but even more questions surrounding a mystery that journalists covering Robert Mueller have been trying to crack for months. To quickly catch you up, since September, a secret witness has been fighting over a sealed grand jury subpoena with an unknown prosecutor in court. People following every little twist and turn of the Mueller probe believe with some confidence that that prosecutor is, in fact, the special counsel. And until now, we had no real clue as to who he was fighting with. But last night, it became a little clearer thanks to the ruling from a federal appeals court. Turns out the person Mueller was up against wasn't a person at all. The ruling revealed the grand jury was seeking information from a corporation, one owned by another country. And guess what? Mueller won. The three-judge panel ruled the feds do have the authority to get the information they want, whatever that information turns out to be. Jason, Chuck, Michelle, Nick, and Ron are all still here. Explain. <laughs> <laughs> Gladly. Um, what you're seeing here is the fact that sophisticated professional investigations go far and wide for information. They have a bunch of ways to do that. One is asking um, the grand jury to issue subpoenas, mm -hmm. which is what happened here. Another is collecting information from overseas, which appears to be what happened here. Um, not the first time. Not the first time, not the last time. In fact, if you look at some of the indictments that the Mueller team has returned, Manafort, Russian intelligence, mm -hmm. you see the hunter-gatherer mode of these investigations. What happened here is that the Court of Appeals in the District of Columbia uh, upheld the subpoena. They said it's valid and that this foreign corporation, part of a foreign country, has to comply with it. One of the reasons these investigations take a long time, for instance, is that you see folks who get subpoenas fight them. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what happened here. It inevitably slowed the investigation, but Mueller prevailed. Ron Klain, I, I hear Chuck Rosenberg say hunter-gatherer as it pertains yeah. to special counsel, and I have this image of Donald Trump running screaming naked through the halls of the East Wing. But put that aside for a minute. This hunter-gatherer. <laughs> but this notion of Robert Mueller hunting and gathering facts, and that there is nothing he will not pursue in his pursuit of the facts and the fact of the 2016 election, that it has ensnared uh, not just a corporation, but a corporation owned by a foreign government. I'm guessing it doesn't surprise you, but what does it tell us about where this investigation is heading? Well, I think it tells us two very important things. I mean, the first is to build on something Chuck said, it tells us this investigation isn't over or nearly over. Mm. I think there's been a lot of buzz in the press that maybe, you know, Mueller's going to wrap this up in the first few weeks of 2019 or whatnot. I think that's not true. I think there's still a lot of investigating to be done from the cooperating witnesses and from things like this, unreturned, unresponded to subpoenas. So I think we're in for more Mueller. And secondly, it also tells us that everything we may know, as large as it seems, may still just be the tip of some icebergs, mm -hmm. and there may be a lot still under the surface. We don't know if Company A is owned by Russia or some other country, but if Company A is owned by Russia, it may just be another data point of how Russian money flowed into our politics mm -hmm. in 2016. And so I think... I think there's a lot of information still yet to come and a lot of investigating still to be done. You've done some great reporting under the iceberg of Cambridge Analytica and some of the businesses that were involved in, in the tech side. Talk about that. Well, look, you know, a big uh, you know, mystery that I have around the Mueller investigation is how much he cares about Cambridge Analytica. We've reported and we know that federal prosecutors have interviewed witnesses uh, connected with both Facebook and Cambridge Analytica. Uh, they've asked questions about their finances. They've asked questions about data sharing. It could be mostly about Facebook and securities issues. It could be partly connected to Russian interference. Uh, because the big question mark, I think, that no one has quite answered uh, is how the Russians targeted their interference campaign. Mm -hmm. uh, the simple and tragic answer could be that Facebook's off-the-shelf targeting was so good, that's all they needed. Because their off-the-shelf targeting is actually very, very good. But it's also possible that they somehow came up with a list of voter targets or states or a strategy with help from a consulting firm or people connected to the one, and that could be CA. I don't know that. But that is a topic that, yeah, it's a big question mark we have about them. Okay, we're way in the weeds, so let, let, let me try to break some of this down. So Sorry. I think one of the questions that, that, that could get the president in trouble is, was there coordinate, and, and Ron and I worked on, on campaigns, if you coordinate with a PAC that has the same goal you have, electing your candidate, that's illegal, that's a crime. We're looking at, we're asking the question, because the question is stunning. They're asking a question, 
did the Russians coordinate target battleground states and content with the Trump campaign? That well, would be stunning. Well, look at those reports that came out um, that were prepared for the Senate just um, this week, right. right? I mean, those reports said that a huge focus of the Russians' work was trying to suppress African-American turnout by sort of exploiting anger around Black Lives Matter and exploiting anger around police violence. Now, Steve Bannon Which has said... Which was a said, Trump message. Right. Steve Bannon has said right. suppressing African-American turnout was so a key Trump. part of their strategy. So it could be that they just independently lighted on these two um, on these two strategies. But at the same time, you know, the um, Internet Research Agency in St. Petersburg had not previously been known for being super sophisticated about American politics. And yet one of the things that the Senate report said was that it actually was fairly... Um, smart about mm -hmm. the way that it directed its messages. And you can't have it both ways. I mean, Brad right. Pascal, who ran the tech side of it, went on 60 Minutes and boasted about just for, for a ragtag campaign whose motto was we couldn't collude with our press office, we didn't <laughs> collude with Russia. The one exception was the, the micro-targeting operation. Right. The, so somehow you guys are just wacky, winging it mavericks, but you figure out the most difficult aspect of campaigning, which is micro-targeting, right? right? Like, no one believes that. And no one believes that the Trump campaign wasn't... No common-sense person can believe that the Trump campaign wasn't getting help, wasn't providing assistance, wasn't at least providing sort of cultural guideposts for this information. Yeah. Uh, but, but I want to step back here, and I, I think this is a key thing about Mueller. Well, he's looking abroad. He's looking domestically. I think the, the longer-term message here or the longer-term impact that I see is all of these different states' attorneys who he's sliding out information to. When, when, his, when his investigation isn't looking at it, they hand it to the Southern District. It's highlighted things that Jared Kushner was doing in Baltimore. You're going to have a generation of state's attorneys that are going to be digging through every single aspect of Trump's background. This, for a, a young Democratic state attorney, is going to be like going after the ACA for a Republican. I'm going to spend the next five years, mm -hmm. and I'm going to run for governor saying, hey, I went after Trump's businesses here in Michigan. That's why I should be your next governor. Chuck, where do you think this... Um, is. There, as Ron said, there's a lot of speculation that Mueller's sort of rounding third base. Where do you think he is? Well, I think Ron's right. I, I mean, I'm in that camp that we have a number of bases yet to go, and here's why, Nicole. Uh, it strikes me that we have folks out there like Corsi and Stone who said that they expect to be indicted. And by the way, who in the world says that unless it's true? <laughs> you know? yeah. And it hasn't happened yet. So presuming it happens, that they want to go to trial, yeah. which is their constitutional right, that could be a year away. Right. We have subpoenas out there. We have other investigations out there, including in the Southern District of New York and the Eastern District of Virginia. So he might write a report. I don't know that that means it's finished. Right. There's pieces of this in other parts of the country. And so I don't look at a report. I mean, it'll be interesting. I'd like to read it. Right. But I don't look at that as the end of this investigation. Because it has tentacles and it has that, things that, that are... That's exactly right. All right. Thank you for spending some time with us today. When we come back, the report...